Welcome to this session of the Plant Pure Summit 2016, co-sponsored by PlantPureFoods.com. Our guest is Dr. Will Tuttle. Dr. Tuttle is a writer, speaker, and musician, and author of the Amazon number one bestseller, The World Peace Diet. He's the co-founder of the Circle of Compassion and the Worldwide Prayer Circle for Animals. He's a former Zen monk who studied in Korea, and he also earned a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, specializing in the philosophy of education. He's a frequent speaker at vegetarian, spiritual, and animal rights conferences and at local vegetarian societies. Welcome to the summit, Dr. Tuttle. Thank you, Lee. It's great to be here. Thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, so, uh, you know, a lot of people see a deep fracture between Eastern and Western philosophy and society. Uh, do you believe that fracture can be bridged? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think uh, essentially the West uh, has a focus, uh, as we all know, more on scientific analysis. And uh, it, it's based really more uh, on animal agriculture uh, in its core, uh, going back about 10,000 years. Uh, whereas the Eastern tradition uh, tends to have less of a, of a strong uh, foundation in animal agriculture. And uh, in my own background uh, of living for a while in Korea as a Zen monk and spending quite a few years uh, studying uh, Eastern traditions and so forth, I think that there's a lot of wonderful uh, cross-fertilization that can go on to help us to uh, enrich our understanding of ourselves, uh, especially in the West, I mean, both, both East and West. And so uh, one of the things that I write about and speak about in uh, the work that, that I'm doing is how we can, as uh, people who live in our society, uh, transform ourselves and our lives and our understanding so that instead of merely uh, being a product of our society where we're eating the foods and thinking the thoughts uh, that have been in many ways forced upon us from the time we're little infants, uh, instead of that, we realize that as we move toward a more plant-based way of living, which has been actually much more uh, common in, uh, in Asian countries, uh, that we see not only will our health improve in terms of our, our hearts and, uh, and uh, many you know, uh, risks for disease, but also I think we find at a deeper level uh, a, a connection uh, back to our true nature uh, also to, uh, to nature itself, to the earth, can be reestablished, and a deeper connection with the internal uh, sense of empathy. I think we naturally have with the created order uh, for other animals, for human beings, and, and so forth. And so I think really that this is a crucial part of the uh, effort that we should be making actually today in our society, not only healing ourselves physically, also psychologically, emotionally, and I would say spiritually as well. So uh, how does the Western way of life do damage to us spiritually? You know, I think the uh, main damage it does to us is that by being raised in a society where uh, we're forced from the time we're little ends to participate in meals where we're uh, eating the flesh of animals who are horribly abused and, and also dairy products and eggs, that we uh, disconnect from the natural feelings of empathy that we have for other animals, especially for cows, pigs, chickens, fishes, uh, turkeys, and so forth. And uh, we also disconnect from the capacity that is innate to make connections, to look deeply, to see what's on our plate and what it took to get it onto our plate. We live in a society where we're taught from the time we're little infants uh, in these rituals, and we have to remember that meals are the most powerful rituals in any society. So when we're eating food together as, uh, as little kids and all the way through our entire lives, we're actually engaging in rituals that keep us in many ways aligned with our culture's values. It's the main way cultures pass values on is through these mealtime rituals from generation to generation. So uh, it's important to understand that these are not in our best interest if we want to create a world uh, of peace and freedom and harmony and sustainability uh, and for ourselves if we want to mature uh, psychologically and spiritually because 
this disconnectedness, which is required of us, really, if we're going to be eating uh, such uh, violence and, uh, and harm, uh, which is not only inflicted on the animals, but also on the workers who have to do this work of stabbing animals all day, uh, also on ecosystems, also on, uh, on hungry people, essentially, whose uh, food that they could be eating, grains and so forth, are being fed to animals so that we have this huge hunger problem. I mean, there's this whole network of, of, uh, of violence and trauma that's inflicted by animal-based foods. And so uh, we're taught, essentially, from the time of little infants, to pay no attention <laughs> to the man behind the curtain <laughs> from, the, from the Wizard of Oz. You know, just don't, pay, don't look behind the curtain, pay no attention to what's going on back there. And it's this very kind of, kind of eerie feeling I have in our society, this kind of strange phenomenon where the, the main activity we're engaged in as a society, as, a, as humanity, really, especially in, in, in the West, is killing animals for food. I mean, there's nothing, there's no project bigger than that. We're, you know, we're killing just in the United States alone, 75 million animals every day, uh, very conservative estimates. So this is a vast industrialized killing machine that requires enormous amounts of not only physical energy, but huge amounts of psychological energy to, to keep doing this. And then everyone is eating this, and, but no one's talking about it. It's completely invisible. We don't talk about the devastation to animals and ecosystems and to each other and to our health that this is causing. Uh, and so from a Carl, you know, Carl Jung, in a sense, um, was, was a great bridge in many ways between Western psychology and Eastern spirituality. And he talked about the shadow archetype, which is essentially... Uh, an ancient teaching, actually wisdom teaching uh, from Asia, but the idea is this is what we are, uh, but what we are not. We don't think we are, right? No, no, we're not. We're, we're good people. We're kind. We're loving. We're caring. Um, and we like a good steak, and we like a good uh, milkshake and cheese and so forth. But there are these other people. Oh, and they're very cruel and violent over there. We have to make lots of weapons and go after them and defend ourselves <laughs> or attack them. And so uh, the irony is that the larger the shadow is, the more difficult it is to see. This is the interesting thing. And so if a shadow is in a sense relatively small, not that big a thing, then we can kind of see it and work with it. But something that's really big, uh, we just don't talk about. There's that old story, you know, the, if we have a dysfunctional family, the main thing that's happening, maybe the, you know, the father perhaps is an alcoholic, that's, and that, the whole or, family is organized around you know, dealing with that, but that's the one thing no one ever talks about. You know, it's taboo to discuss. It's the same thing in our society. We have this rampant um, violence towards animals, which causes us a lot of physical disease, psychological, and I would say sh social and uh, cultural disease, as well as a psychological uh, and environmental <laughs> uh, devastation. And yet we don't make those connections. Why is that? Well, it's, I think in many ways, because we're uncomfortable with looking at this because it causes us to question things that are for many of us just a little bit too dicey to question if we don't have to because it connects us to our mother and our father and this yearning we have to be part of the family, to be part of the group, to be part of Thanksgiving dinner, to be part of the, the church uh, barbecue or the, or the company fish fry, or whatever it is, we wanna be part of the group. And uh, so we just, uh, would rather not look at that. And then, of course, we have these very powerful uh, organizations, uh, large corporations uh, with enormous wealth, uh, who also do not want us to look at this. And they work very hard to make sure that this is not in the news. Uh, my father actually owned a newspaper chain when I was a kid. And I learned early on, sitting around the table, that you, know, you do not run news stories that your advertisers don't like. They'll, then they'll advertise in the other guy's newspaper, right? So, yeah. so it's, it's this whole, there's this whole thing uh, in, our, in our media. We have to understand that, that corporations are advertising, and they're basically paying for what news we're going to see and what news we're not going to see. So that's why I think it's very important to have efforts like this, this summit, where we can get together, we can share ideas, we don't have to be uh, under the pall of, of corporate America, in a sense, and we can learn from each other and share these ideas that are liberating uh, on every level. Yeah. Uh, so when and why did you decide to become vegan yourself? For me, it was, uh, I think for like a lot of people, it was a two-step process. Um, the first step was uh, when I basically I left home right after college. 
and uh, I was going to try to get to California, and uh, I wanted to live a life more uh, actually of meditation and try to discover uh, myself. Uh, and so I ended up living in a Zen center, but on the way, I was on this walk actually with my, with my brother from Concord, Massachusetts, where we were born and raised. We were trying to get to California, and we ended up getting as far as this hippie commune in Tennessee <laughs> called, the, called The Farm. Uh, and that, was, that took us about four months to, to get to walk there. And we got there, and it was the largest, at that point, the largest hippie commune in the world, about 900 people. And they were actually mostly from California, and they were all vegetarians. So for me, I think a critical point uh, for me in my understanding was realizing that the only reason I was eating meat, dairy products, and eggs, and so forth, was because of the communities I had been raised in. And so when I found myself in this other community where everybody was eating plant-based foods and they had probably 200 children who were vegan from birth uh, and they were all thriving. Everybody was thriving. Everybody was healthy and, and vibrant and enthusiastic. It was an amazingly vibrant community. And they called themselves vegetarians, but they were actually vegans because no one heard of the word vegan back in 1975, but they were just not eating meat or dairy or eggs. And so for me, that was it. I never ate meat again in my life since that day I was at the farm at the end of 1975. And uh, I was talking to this fellow about why are you guys vegetarians? And he told me about the fact that most of the grain we're growing, we're feeding to animals, all people are starving. And that's causing war and conflict in the world and tremendous suffering to humans. And then he also asked me, he said, do you know what the animals go through? that people are eating. And I said, oh, I don't want to hear it. Don't tell me. <laughs> and he told me a little bit of just the terrible mutilations and hyper confinement and castrations and impregnation, forced impregnations, and just this horrific violence. And it was kind of like, again, the Wizard of Oz, he, he sort of pulled back the curtain and I saw this uh, enormous, uh, unconscionable violence. And at the same time, the beauty was I had a living example of an alternative community of people and we were eating meals together, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So that was it. I never ate meat again in my life. So that was the first step. And then uh, about five years later, I was living in San Francisco at that point in 1980. And it was really more of an internal step. I, and I think for many people, it is this way. Uh, I learned more about the cruelty to animals, uh, dairy cows and hens you know, mainly. So uh, for dairy products. And so I became a vegan in 1980. And uh, that, shortly after that, and uh, a few years later, I went to Korea and lived as a Zen monk. And I found myself actually for the second time in a community that was vegan. Uh, this time it was the Zen monastery. And, and, and that community, they've been practicing, again, what we would call veganism for about 750 years, you know, <laughs> since the 1200s. And so I realized very deeply that this, this so-called veganism is not this newfangled hippie idea, you know, this new thing. It's really an ancient wisdom tradition that goes back thousands of years that people have understood intuitively that if we're serious about being healthy, uh, not just physically healthy, but psychologically and spiritually and emotionally and contributing to a healthy society, then we have to practice what is referred to essentially as ahimsa, the ancient Sanskrit word. It just means nonviolence. Practice nonviolence. In other words, don't harm others for your own benefit because as soon as I start doing that, as soon as I start manipulating or harming others for my own benefit, I not only harm them, I actually harm myself. It's, it's called the boomerang effect in a sense. You know, that, that old saying that we all know very well, whatever we sow, we reap. You know, whatever we put out comes back. This is very true. And so the golden rule is based on that, to, you know, to sow seeds of kindness, to be kind to others as we would like to have that done to us. And so I realized that, that actually this, there's an ancient tradition that's really come through in many ways through, through many religions and spiritual traditions, but it's been suppressed, especially in our society. This is suppressed a lot, and it's been kind of forgotten. But once you uh, kind of tap into it and realize it's there, it's everywhere. We, I've seen this. I used to teach college courses in philosophy, and, and, and I've studied uh, also and taught comparative religion. And it's fascinating to see how widespread this understanding actually has been that if we uh, commit violence towards animals, we will have war, we will have disease, we will have conflict, uh, we will not be happy. And so we, we see this being taught, but we see it, that we've forgotten that. And so uh, I think today it's fantastic that we're beginning to rediscover and reawaken 
the natural wisdom that is our true nature. Well, that's a really uh, great wisdom, actually, from uh, the past, and it's uh, you know amazing that it's it's so ancient, and yet, as you say, we've ignored it uh, pretty much completely, at least in the West. Uh, so, but how did becoming a vegan affect you personally, both physically and spiritually? Yeah, you know, uh, I I found actually when I went vegetarian first, that that was helpful for sure. I mean, I was living in meditation centers. I was doing a lot of uh, just trying to understand myself better and doing more reading. But I also found I just got healthier. You know, I had more energy and so forth. But then when I went vegan and gave up the dairy uh, and eggs, that was uh, really fantastic for me because I I remember this, this sense of, of having boundless energy, you know, all the time, just en- on the energy. I didn't do it for that reason. You know, I really did it because I was um, concerned. I didn't, I, the idea of, of this uh, serial, basically rape and kill operation that we have for dairy and eggs, um, I just couldn't tolerate participating in that. But um, I found not only did my physical health improve, and actually, Lee, I have not been to a doctor now in over 40 years. I mean, ever since I went vegetarian, I just haven't had anything, you know, and I've been, uh, <laughs> Madeline and I have been putting on probably, you know, 150 to 200, sometimes 250 events a year for a lot, over 10 years, actually for about 25 years. And I've never missed one, you know, it's, it's been uh, this wonderful kind of freedom from any kind of, you know, physical problem. There was this, you know, we, we, we went to the Grand Canyon not too long ago and, um, I'm now in kind of in, I'm just turning 63, but I remember it was a couple of years ago and they have these signs everywhere that you should never go down to the Colorado river and back in one day. And so I said, well, I'm going to try that. You know, so I went down and I was back up again uh, before noon for lunch. <laughs> and I said, well, those signs they have, they're not made for vegans. You know, those are made for regular people who probably, you know, would die if they try. <laughs> just kidding. But, you know, if we're, if we're eating the diet we're designed for, you know, and our arteries aren't all clogged with saturated fat and cholesterol and acidifying and uh, inflammatory animal protein, then we naturally are, you know, not going to experience the kind of health uh, problems that, uh, we would have if we're eating foods that we're not designed for. But at a deeper level, what's really been uh, wonderful for me is really two things. Number one, um, I think from the point of view of meditation, in, inner peace, basically being able to quiet the mind, being able to feel a sense of harmony uh, with nature and with other people and with you know, basically with life itself, and also a sense of being uh, an expression of a purpose, you know, having the sense of living here uh, on this earth with a reason uh, that is um, that is worthwhile and having a basic sense of self-respect and a, a sense of self-confidence. I think you know, eating animal foods really undermines that subconsciously. If I'm if I'm taking out my wallet and paying someone to do horrible work or to stab animals and to mutilate animals and bring out the worst in other people and causing suffering to animals and then actually eating that stuff. And, uh, it's not going to make me feel positive essentially about life and about the world. I think that's the reason we create uh, competitive economic systems that are very often uh, destructive to ecosystems and really to human relationships. So I think, underlying everything is this possibility that we can uh, live in a different way, that we can find uh, our true nature through, uh, li- through questioning the official protein story, questioning the official calcium story, questioning the official human superiority story, you know, having some humility, realizing that there are so many other species on this earth that love to celebrate their lives. Why don't we let them do that? Why don't we support them in celebrating their lives? Why do we have to ruin it for everybody else here? You know, why do we have to imprison all these animals and destroy all this habitat? Because that's what animal agriculture does. And I think when we begin to be part of the solution, and anyone who's eating a plant-based diet uh, is being part of the solution. That is, and if we're not eating a plant-based diet, we really are part of the problem because animal agriculture is so devastating to ecosystems and to hungry people and to future generations. And we're all aware of that, I think, subconsciously. 
And more and more, I think we're aware of it consciously. And so uh, the other thing I've found uh, besides the inner peace is that um, my relationships have, have just gotten so much more harmonious also. And I've found this for many, for many people I've talked to. They, people have said, well, you know, I read the World Peace Diet. I went vegan. And now I don't fight with my husband anymore like we used to or my wife. You know, we get together. We, we're much more, uh, we don't have all these arguments all the time. And I really think that this is a, a very true, that if we're consciously cultivating uh, kindness and compassion for, for animals, uh, and we're realizing that other human beings are also animals, and we're really working on that level to uh, be kind and loving in our relationships, that uh, when we're not eating violence, uh, we're not eating anger, we're not eating despair, we're not eating frustration, we're going to be much less likely to be expressing anger and frustration and despair because we're actually doing the best we can to be kind and loving to others. So I think it's important to eat a plant-based diet. I would also say while we're at it, as much as we can to, to, use, to, to use and to buy foods uh, that are unprocessed as much as possible, whole foods without a lot of chemical additives, not genetically engineered, without violence in them, uh, you know, organic would be good. If we can grow our own food, if we can support local people. I think a lot of it is also about uh, as much as we can to re um, to see what's the word like to kind of revitalize our communities so that we're more cooperative so that we're more self-sufficient at the local level to support farmers markets you know, that kind of thing where we know who's growing our food or if we're growing it ourselves we're, we're working together I think the more we can do that and make those kinds of deep connections with the earth and with the food and with our neighborhoods and with our communities. Uh, and get away from mass industrialized, chemicalized, uh, violent forms of, of, of agriculture, uh, the more we're just going to be creating uh, happiness and harmony on every level, psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, and culturally as well. Uh, so when and why were you inspired to write your uh, book, The World Peace Diet? You know, that, that essentially was because I, I, I just realized that you know, I, I started talking to Madeline about this. I, you know, I said to Madeline, you know, no one's written a book that gives the big picture of our culture's mistreatment of animals for food. Uh, there, there are people who have written books that you know, eating animal foods is not good for your health. Uh, it's not good for the environment. It's not good for the, the poor animals you know, who suffer. And those three things are important. But through the research I was doing, both uh, getting my PhD at Berkeley, being a longtime vegan, also as a musician and meditator and, and world religions and all these other things, uh, I began to see that it's way bigger than that. And when we look at the spiritual dimension, the social, cultural, anthropological, historical dimension, and see that we live in a culture that's organized at its core around imprisoning animals, herding animals, and yet we're not aware of that. Uh, I just thought, you know, someone's going to write a book about it. I can't wait to read that book. That was what I said to Madeline. And I spent a few, <laughs> a few years kind of looking forward to reading this book that I knew someone was going to write. And finally, Madeline said, well, Will, if you want to read that book, you'll have to write it yourself, <laughs> which I didn't want to hear. Um, but I spent, ended up spending five years from 2000 to 2005 writing The World Peace Diet. It was, it was published right after that. And then it, uh, we just released now the 10... Uh, year anniversary edition, and it's now been published in, I think we're up to about 16 or 17 languages worldwide, and it was an uh, Amazon bestseller in 2010. So it's great to see that this is really a worldwide movement, uh, that there is an interest in seeing the big picture of, uh, of, of food, that there are so many overlays, so many dimensions of our food that affect us uh, psychologically, emotionally, culturally, spiritually, and the great good news is that on every level, as we move to a whole foods, plant-based, organic uh, diet and way of eating and way of living, really, that we just bring healing on every level, on, in every dimension. And so that was the main thing. I wanted to take, I thought someone should just write a book that would take our routine mistreatment of animals for food and take it from being way down on the list. It's not that important. All these you know, animals being killed, well, that's not that important because they're just animals and we're much more important. So we get to solve our problems first and say no. Our routine mistreatment of animals should be at the top of the list because it's not only the most devastating thing we're doing uh, to, to other beings and you know, causing the most suffering and to ecosystems, but it's also the most devastating thing we're doing to ourselves because the violence in animal agriculture 
is actually the worst thing we're doing to the earth. And, you know, we can talk about that at some point, but it's the worst thing we're doing to the earth. It's devastating to ecosystems, to our society. It's causing hunger and war and conflict and, and to our health. But what the World Peace Diet really goes into, which I'm glad we've been able to talk about it already, is that it, it, we're eating also, besides these foods uh, that are toxic to us, we're eating attitudes that are not in our best interest. We're eating attitudes of, like, of disconnectedness, of commodification of life, of privilege and elitism, of exclusivism, of dominating the, the, the sacred feminine dimension of life. That's a big thing. I think that's a, one of the main components of the loss of real authentic spirituality is the fact that animal agriculture uh, forces us to not just kill animals, but to kill and dominate female animals. And especially it's about the domination of female reproductive cycles, like mothers giving birth to babies or stealing their babies, stealing their milk, stealing their eggs, pregnating them against their will. It's all this violence against what is really the most sacred uh, and most important dimension of life, which is mothers giving birth and bringing forth uh, children and nurture, nur nurturing and nursing those children. And we know that in human societies, that is critical to a healthy society is, is mothers that love and care for and protect their children and, and create a strong foundation for the family, a healthy family. You need that for a healthy society. But what we're doing to animals is we destroy families. We destroy that. We destroy the sacred feminine bond uh, I refer to this as Sophia. Sophia was the ancient Greek goddess of wisdom. So we're really attacking the roots of wisdom uh, in ourselves and in our society by animal agriculture, by just doing this horror millions and upon millions of times every day. And so we have to understand that we can create a society of joy and liberation and health and freedom. The only price we have to pay is animal-based foods and allow the animals to celebrate their lives as the way we would like to do that ourselves. And so that's not what I love about this message. It's not, we're not just criticizing uh, an obsolete violent system. We have an alternative that's fantastic, right? It's delicious. It's nutritious. We can feed everyone on a fraction of the land. And it's just a matter of understanding this and sharing this message. Uh, how long did it take for the book to become successful? And, and uh, how did it make you feel when it did become successful? <laughs> Well, it's, you know, I think in a sense, um, it, it, you know, there's always, it, it took a few years to uh, build the momentum. And now the momentum is rolling, but I see this actually, the World Peace Diet is really just in a sense a, a small subset of the larger movement of, of veganism or moving to a plant-based way of living, which is also gathering momentum. And I would say uh, it's great to think that it has been successful, but from my point of view, it really, it's not yet successful because to me, it's really successful when we create a vegan society, you know, then it's successful. <laughs> so we still have, we still have a ways to go uh, before it's really successful. I think in the sense that, you know, we're, there's still enormous um, uh, amount of misunderstanding in people about this. And that's understandable in the sense that we have a lot of, uh, inertia you know we have 10,000 years of killing animals and we're born into that system but the good news is that this is changing rapidly I think we see underneath the radar uh, a lot of change happening in people's attitudes and um, I think the success really of our species whether or not we're able to pass a world on to our children that they are actually able to inhabit and thrive is just dependent on whether we are successful at understanding these ideas, bringing our lives into alignment with these ideas, and then sharing these ideas with others. Uh, that's, I think, is really the greatest um, gift we can give to the world. Uh, how do you think uh, plant-based nutrition fits into America's healthcare system? <laughs> well, right now, uh, you know, America, the United States has a healthcare system that's sort of renowned throughout, you know, the galaxy for being terribly uh, inefficient and, and ineffective and expensive and uh, causing a lot of suffering through drugs and, and so forth. And um, so I think uh, the good news is that we're seeing more and more healthcare professionals moving uh, in the direction of advising uh, patients and the general public to move, to, move toward a more plant-based way of living, especially those that are modeled on uh, a more cooperative uh, model 
uh, where uh, their profits come from people being more healthy. You know, if we have a system that's where profits are generated by the most sick, the sicker the people are, then the more money they make, you know, that's kind of counterproductive. So um, I think the whole idea is to try to realize that it's best for everyone if we're healthy. And uh, so as, uh, you know, I think healthcare professionals feel that way, naturally, that's why they go into the profession. And as we question the old stories, which uh, are, is starting to happen, you know, there's a lot of, um, uh, there's just a lot of evidence that uh, doctors are, and nurses and, and dietitians uh, haven't really been given the, the, the correct information about nutrition. And so it's important for us, I think, who are not doctors and so forth to you know, help educate doctors also and to really take responsibility for our health uh, as individuals to, um, to demand, in a sense, uh, a second opinion. You know, if our doctor says, well, you know, you just need to eat some meat to get enough B12, uh, you need to eat, you know, you need to eat some steak or you need to eat some fish or something, uh, we should ask for a second opinion. Go, go, to, go, go to another doctor or, or try to find or do some research because if that doctor said to us, well, you just need to eat a little bit of dog meat, you know, we'd say, oh, what do you mean dog meat? I'm not going to do that. We, you know, we get a second opinion. <laughs> but if they say, so we need to eat some pig meat, we say, oh, okay. Well, the doctor said I had to do it, so I do it. You know, to realize, you know, we should take responsibility for the ramifications of our actions. If we're causing violence and misery and terror and fear, that's also uh, going to affect us on some level, even if everybody's doing it. Because we can look back at the, in the, during the time of slavery and in the South, like we were in South Carolina, or something in you know in the 1800s and everybody is doing it in a sense i mean it's, it's well accepted but we can look back now and we see that was not a good system for anybody really and it's the same thing today it, it, the more we can bring our lives in, in, into alignment with uh, being a, uh, an expression of health and freedom and joy and, and sustainability it's going to come back to us we're not going to be penalized for that essentially that's my feeling and uh, so uh, it's like anything else. Uh, when the people lead, then the leaders will follow. I think it has to be a grassroots kind of an awakening. And from that level, it'll trickle up uh, to the doctors, to the medical establishment, to governmental agencies, to, to uh, you know, stopping the subsidies, which are making animal foods way too inexpensive. I mean, this stuff should be taxed, I think, like, like cigarettes. I mean, it's toxic. It's devastating. We, we shouldn't be subsidized. It should be taxed. But, you know, we, all that is going to take us working at the grassroots level to uh, raise awareness about this. Uh, do you see uh, this greater awareness of the benefits of plant-based nutrition uh, growing and transforming our healthcare system in the years ahead? Do you think there's a growing awareness of that among doctors and stuff like that that's actually going to help? Definitely. Yeah, there's definitely a growing awareness of it. I mean, it's, it's happening more and more. You, people can't really get away with it anymore uh, to say that you, or you just need to eat meat or dairy to be healthy. And I, I think especially, which I think is very good, there's a, a, uh, an awakening about dairy. I mean, the dairy products uh, are very, they're not, we are not designed to be eating the mammary secretions of bovine. You know, we're not bovines. What are we doing? I mean, there's, there's endemic, so many endemic toxins in dairy products, uh, the, the, the growth hormones and uh, IGF, you know, just so many things, and estrogen and so forth, as well as casein. Uh, these are really hard for us. Plus, they concentrate so many toxins as well. And all animal foods concentrate toxins. That's well understood. And uh, so... The basic idea, and then of course we have this other idea, which is gathering momentum too, of global climate change. You know, global warming uh, of of water. It takes a thousand gallons of water to make one gallon of milk. We're cutting down rainforest at an acre per second. These are the lungs of the earth in order to grow soybeans to, to feed the cows and pigs and chickens. We're not going to, you know, we're destroying the lungs of the planet, which are which are the oceans and the rainforest. In animal agriculture, cows eat more fish than human beings do in the United States because scientists discovered that if you enrich the feed of cows with fish meal, uh, it's profitable. They give more milk and they fatten up. So this kind of, you know, the toxins are all concentrating. Heavy metals, PCBs, dioxins, nuclear radiation, all this stuff is concentrating in the fish and in uh, meat and dairy products and eggs. We're eating those toxins. We're finding cancer rates increasing. Uh, you know, all of these things. We have to be asleep, really, to be eating animal foods when we understand the, the level of toxins that we're eating. We're not just eating physical toxins, we're also eating fear and terror and despair and anxiety as well. And uh, so I think really the, um, 
the, the basic flow uh, in our society, as long as we maintain uh, some capacity uh, to communicate with each other and to ask questions, is definitely going to be away from animal foods and toward more plant-based foods because of the uh, fact that you know, we just cannot do that anymore on this planet. It's, it's biologists have looked at this and they have already told us that if everyone on planet Earth ate the way people in the United States eat, it would take two and a half to three more Earth, you know, two and a half to three Earths to support everyone, right? We, cannot, we just cannot do it. It's literally impossible. We have to reduce the amount of meat and dairy. It takes, too much, it takes 15 times. I mean, this is very important to understand. It takes 15 times as much land to feed people a standard Western diet as it does someone eating uh, a plant-based diet. So we're not talking about just two to one or three to one. We're talking about basically 15 to one. And these are conservative estimates, essentially. It, with fresh water pollution and fresh water depletion, it's closer to 25 or 30 to one, according to the United Nations. And so by moving to a plant-based ways of living, uh, we actually make it possible for seven and a half billion people on planet Earth to thrive and allow the rainforest to come back and the oceans to come back and the and habitat to come back and animals uh, to live their lives and human beings to live our lives. And if we don't do that, if we're going to insist on eating meat, dairy products, and eggs, uh, we're, we're basically insisting on a world of utter devastation, of continuing uh, heating up of the, uh, of the climate and fires and water shortages and uh, just uh, devastation uh, to ecosystems on every level, soil erosion, water pollution, and uh, just more hunger, more war. That's gun that is absolutely part of animal agriculture. And I think it's important also to remember that these cows who are eating all this soy and all this corn and all this fish, now they're not designed actually, they're designed to eat grass. Why are they eating these foods? It's important to understand this. They're eating those foods because those foods are not in their, not because they're in the, their best interest, it's because they're in the best interest of their exploiters, right? I mean, they're being exploited, to, they're being used so to maximize profits for the people that own them. That's why they're being forced to eat fish meal. That's why it's mixed into their feed. So they can, if they get, give some cancer, but they just, they don't care, you know, they just do it. So we have to understand that essentially, really, it's maybe hard to think of it that way, but it's, I guess there's a truth to it, that if we're eating meat, dairy products, and eggs, we're also actually being exploited. <laughs> we're eating foods that are not in our best interest, like the dairy cows, and, it, we, and we are giving a lot of money uh, to forces that really um, are, are not essentially helping us. I think our health is such a wonderful gift. And, it's, and our health is essentially the true nature of reality is that we're all interconnected. I think we know that in our bones. We are interconnected. If we uh, live our lives to bless others, we'll be blessed. If we live our lives to encourage and love others, that comes back. And so uh, to not harm others uh, also comes back to us. And to not exploit others also comes back to us. If we want to not be exploited, then we should not exploit others and we will find that our minds become clearer. We see the connections that we couldn't see before. And I've met so many people who went vegan or plant-based because of health reasons. And then as they learn more about actually what's happening to animals, then their motivation deepens and they, they begin to realize that, gosh, you know, I don't want to eat animal-based foods because of the other reasons, the environmental devastation, the, the abuse of animals, the hunger of starving people. And there's, there's many others who are suffering also. And I think as our motivation deepens, then we uh, really begin to uh, connect more powerfully with a movement that can positively transform our society. Yeah, it does seem to me that, uh, and I, I say this a lot to probably everybody that we interview, that, uh, you know, just by switching to this diet, you are automatically addressing three big problems, three big issues. One is health, two is the environment, and three is the humanitarian aspect of it. Exactly, and right. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's a win, win, win. Uh, and, uh, you know, just by doing the one, you're automatically doing the others. You, you know, you don't even have to necessarily embrace right. or believe in the other things. Right. But, That's true. <laughs> exactly. But you're, you know, you're doing it anyway. You know, right. it's happening anyway. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's really true. And I think if we, um, if we are aware of that, though, it just helps us 
uh, not cheat a little here, cheat a little there. You know, we, we begin to really own it. And I think owning it uh, makes it is, is helpful because then we can begin to share it with other people. And this is, I think, something that's really important now, too, is that we begin to bring these ideas to our friends and neighbors and colleagues. So uh, what do you mean by the benevolent revolution? Well, essentially, you know, when we hear the word revolution, uh, we usually think some kind of violent thing, you know, guns going off and bombs and things, we, people trying to change the world and, uh, in a way. And I think essentially what we're looking at with, with veganism is uh, a revolution. I think it's also maybe even a better word is evolution, because I think it's a, it's a movement, it's a growth process uh, to a more mature state of being where uh, we're living uh, our purpose more in alignment with our true nature. And uh, it's benevolent because that's the core value. I think the core value uh, in everything, really, that is worthwhile is the value of benevolence, that we're living our lives to wish the best. That's what benevolence literally means, to wish the best for others. And so if I'm living my life to wish the best for others, then I'm naturally going to be happy myself, I think, because the more um, we try to create contexts that encourage other, others to thrive, to have communities that are happy, peaceful and sustainable and in harmony, uh, the more essentially we're living a life of meaning. I think at a deep level, we all feel this, that a life that's only devoted to self-aggrandizement or to self um, uh, grasping in a sense, uh, we may get a lot, we may sort of attain something uh, that we were trying to attain, but very often it's empty because it's shallow. And so uh, benevolence really has this connotation of uh, living a life of kindness and caring, which naturally leads to compassion and empathy, which naturally leads to justice and to equality and to uh, a maturity, I think, as a society where we are now uh, worthy to live on this planet. One of the things I think that's important to understand, I think we all know, is that we, in many ways in our society, have become somewhat disconnected from nature, and we've lost sight of the beauty of nature. I, I just want to encourage everyone to take time every day really to do two things. One, to quiet our minds and listen inside, and to get guidance from within ourselves not to always think that guidance has to come from outside of us, from some expert or some authority outside of us. Do we have an inner wisdom that we can learn to connect? The inner wisdom is not just the program thinking. It really is quieting our mind and listening. And I think if we take 10 or 15 or minutes or half an hour or an hour you know, in the morning or evening or some point to, to just take time to be quiet, we'll gradually learn um, to distinguish this inner voice, this inner knowing, this inner truth, and to trust that more and more to guide us in our lives. And that will help us, I think, a lot to, to, to uh, connect with an inner knowing that we can rely on to, to live our unique life, which, uh, which naturally brings a sense of joy and gratitude into our lives. And then the other thing, every day if we can, to take time to just notice the beauty of this earth the animals that are celebrating their lives, birds and butterflies and moths and, and, and other animals, and see there's a, a whole unfoldment of life here that's so spectacular and so beautiful and so precious. And to really feel, to, you know, cultivate a feeling uh, for that and that we're part of that. And I think as we do that as individuals, uh, we create a field of, of awareness that is healing. For ourselves, we feel that this nature, this this powerful life force is living in us, is living in every cell of our being. And we have a purpose here, and it's to celebrate our lives and to serve the higher order and to bring our lives into alignment with our unique capacities to do that. And then also to see the beauty of life. We are that beauty ourselves. We're beautiful. We're beautiful expressions of life. And to celebrate that and to see that in others. Don't just look at the surface level and see a diseased person. Look, at, look beyond that and see the light in their eyes. Don't look at their weight or their shoe size or whatever it is. You know, look at the being and see the being there and do the same thing for cows and pigs and chickens and for dogs and cats and birds and try to see the beyond the surface to the, to the life that is celebrating. We're just here for a short time. It's important to remember that. We're just here for seven or eight decades, nine decades. Maybe if we eat a lot of sprouts, really healthy, we're here for 10 decades, right? Or something. But it's not that long. It goes by quickly. So for the precious time that we have, 
to remember, we, you know, to, that it's, it's a great opportunity to learn, to grow, and to contribute, to help build a world of peace and freedom by living that ourselves. And, and it's, veganism really is a plant-based way of living. It's really about one thing. It's about love. It's, that's what it is. It's love for others, love for ourselves, love for our life, kindness, caring, tenderness, mercy, gentleness, freedom. They're all the same. They're all synonymous with this whole thing. It's about loving kindness, connectedness, awareness. And, uh, and that means naturally that we'll question some of the official stories that are based on violence. But the main thing is we're living a life of kindness and love. And that is what I think uh, is the foundation of the benevolent revolution. Well, that's, I think, a really beautiful uh, and thoughtful way to sum up everything uh, and very profound. Uh, since you started spreading this message, how far has it come? <laughs> I think we've come a long way. You know, I mean, when I look back, when I was, you know, a vegan trying to spread this message in 1980, 1981, uh, no one knew what this word vegan meant. They didn't know how to say it, didn't know, you know, anything about it. it was all, and um, it's so great to see that, you know, I remember when I became a vegan, you know, I remember the very first vegan ice cream, you know, it was um, at, at the farm in Tennessee. It was, we called it ice bean. We would take soybeans, we'd cook these soybeans, then we'd squeeze them through cheesecloth. We'd get this, this liquid would come out Then we'd add some sugar to it. We'd try to thicken it up and then we'd freeze it. And then we had, you know, soy ice cream, <laughs> you know, it was terrible. <laughs> but you know, I thought, well, it's pretty good. You know, it's all again. You know? <laughs> and when I look now at the vegan ice creams, the vegan cheeses, the vegan, you know, everything, yogurt, meats, you know, hamburgers, you know, eggs, mayonnaise, you know, this is a, you can go into the store. I mean, you can go into restaurants now. You don't know if it's, there are, there are things that no one can even really tell the difference. There are uh, people who are uh, promoting veganism in countless ways. It's, it's, it's permeating YouTube, permeating popular culture. Uh, there's no, I think, no restaurant now that doesn't know what veganism is, you know. And so I think in 30 years uh, that I've been, I've been a vegan now 36 years. In, th in those years, I've seen absolutely uh, breathtaking progress, really, when you think about the array of forces that are uh, against this, in a sense. I mean, in terms of you know, disease being profitable and war. But, but the good news is that there's a grassroots uprising, uh, a wising uh, up wising, you know, wising up, you know, we're, we're, we're learning, we're getting some wisdom and we're seeing that uh, we can share these ideas and we can spread them and that there's a whole new array of, of businesses and people, vegan coaches and vegan, you know, all kinds of things where it's, it's a, it's a whole budding uh, new uh, way of living. And so, but Mr. Fuller, I think he was very wise also. He said, if we have a system that's obsolete and violent, it, it, it's not that good of an idea to just fight against it and try to knock it down. He said, instead of that, create an alternative that makes this other system obsolete. <laughs> and I think that's what we're doing. You know, we're just, just work on something with love and, and creativity. And I think everybody can find some way that they can plug in. We can all find some way we can share these ideas, maybe give a cooking class or do a little video or blog or write or talk to people. And we can find our unique voice and our way of contributing and contribute to this. And uh, I think the momentum is every single day is I see it building. I just see more, the conversation is getting louder and louder and louder and more and more complex, more and more interconnections happening everywhere, more and more agreement, more and more understanding that we're in this together, uh, more and more uh, hearts reaching out to embrace uh, each other. Uh, with this understanding, and I think it's essentially an unstoppable movement. The main thing is to just keep uh, all of us doing the best we can to embody this message. In other words, not trying to change other people, but more trying to love other people and share our experience uh, with them as, uh, as friends. You know, we're friends. We're not better than anybody or anything. We're just we're learning and we're sharing. And I think as long as we just continue with that spirit, then we'll they will really creating a movement that absolutely will continue to, to gather and gain momentum. Uh, among the crowds who come to hear you speak now, uh, what's sort of the age range of those people? Do you see a lot of young people uh, now, uh, uh, more young people now as opposed to 10 years ago, let's say? Yeah, you know, I, I see a lot more young people. There's, um, 
used to be more somewhat older people, uh, you know, kind of old hippies and people uh, who were social justice people and who were starting to make those connections. And uh, it's been great in the last, I'd say, 10 or 15 years, seeing this, these, these, the younger generations really uh, jumping in and uh, totally passionate about this and um, bringing so much creativity and energy uh, to the whole uh, movement. And um, I think uh, it's very inspiring, really, to see what, what people are doing. I can't keep up with it anymore. I mean, it used to be I could kind of keep up with the movement. I kind of knew everybody. It's like totally beyond me at this point. It's just happening. <laughs> it's growing so fast. I have no idea, really. It, it, it's, and it's just great to see it. Yeah. Well, uh, it, it's, it's gotten that way uh, because of people like you. Uh, I'll say that. And uh, so I uh, thank you for your passion and your wisdom and your understanding. And, oh, actually, yeah. and I thank you for, uh, especially for taking the time to be a part of this. And uh, uh, it's been great talking to you. A, a last thing, do you have a website where people can go and uh, sure. learn? Sure. Yeah, sure. It's uh, uh, World Peace Diet dot com this worldpeacediet.com and we have there our tour schedule we're doing uh, lots of lectures we also have a, a train online training world peace mastery you can go there worldpeacemastery.com but that's also a link from worldpeacediet.com we're happy to uh, be in touch with uh, folks with everybody who's listening if you have any questions or um, any anything just uh, you can send us an email and we uh, look forward to uh, working together well, and I'd like to thank everybody for watching, and we encourage everybody to learn about our efforts to build a plant pure nation at our website, which is plantpurenation.com. Well, thanks again. Thank you very Great. much. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Lee.